Well, hello, everyone. It's always very nice these days, isn't it, to actually see people in the room. Uh, but we also, this is a hybrid seminar, so there are also um, quite a few people online as well. And in fact, more people online than in the room. So um, uh, I want to uh, welcome those of you who are online as well. Uh, welcome to the second PEP seminar. Uh, it's a panel discussion today. I'm very happy to see um, those of you here and online. Uh, and our panel discussion is on why people do or do not uh, protect nature. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kelly Fielding. I'm a professor in the School of Communication and Arts. And from a disciplinary perspective, I think of myself as an environmental psychologist. So this topic is very close to my heart. Now, um, before we go any further, though, I would just like to... Uh, on behalf of the University of Queensland, acknowledge the traditional owners um, and their custodianship on the lands in which we meet. So they are the Turrbal and Yagara people here in Brisbane. Um, those of you um, probably around the country will be on different lands. Um, I want to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and to recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Now, uh, a key aim of the PEP seminars are to uh, uh, involve early career researchers in both the uh, setting up and the running of the seminars um, and also uh, to uh, as much as possible to connect with practitioners and policy makers um, and I'm very happy to say that I uh, am co-chairing the seminar today uh, with uh, somebody who uh, fits both of those bills and I'm just going to um, uh, show you Lily who's just here um, so um, welcome Lily, who's online in Victoria. And let me just read out Lily's, uh, Lily's uh, bio so that I don't get anything wrong. Lily's a postdoctoral fellow in applied conservation behavior uh, change for the Victorian government. Her research focuses on understanding pro-nature behaviors to inform the government's Victorians value nature strategy that aims to get Victorians connecting with and acting to protect nature via a range of target behaviors. Now she really sits at this academic government interface um, and she connects in with uh, colleagues at the Behaviour Works Australia at Monash University and Icon Science at RMIT. So um, Lily is going to uh, pose after both uh, Hugh and Tassiano speak. Um, Lily is going to pose um, some synthesizing or probing or difficult questions. I'm going to leave it up to Lily to decide what type of questions she wants to uh, uh, present to Hugh and to Tassiano. All right. Um, now we are very fortunate to have two excellent speakers here today. I'm really excited that they have uh, agreed to take part. Um, Professor Hugh Possingham, who is here in the room, and Professor Tassiano Milfont, um, who is here just online. Um, and just to give you a bit of a sense of how it's going to run, um, Hugh will speak first, followed by Tassiano. Um, I'll hand over to Lily to, uh, you know, uh, pose some uh, questions to them and then I'll open it up to the audience here in the room as well as the audience online to ask questions. So hopefully we can have a good uh, discussion at the end. So I'd like to now move to introducing uh, Professor Hugh Possingham. Uh, I've had the good fortune to uh, see to meet Hugh on a few different occasions and also to uh, see him speak on a few different occasions. And I have to say that um, I always have this experience of thinking differently about an issue after I hear him speak, and that's no pressure, Hugh. <laughs> so um, I think that the fact that he has had so many different roles in his career uh, means that he brings a very clear-eyed perspective to nature conservation. Uh, so he has uh, outstanding academic cre credentials. He has uh, formerly been an ARC Laureate Fellow. He has been the Director of the Centre of, of Excellence for Environmental Decision Making. He has led, and currently still leads, a large um, lab of researchers who are dedicated and passionate about protecting uh, you know, nature and biological uh, diversity uh, um, globally. Um, in addition to that, though, he has also been the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that organization, um, it is a big global environmental NGO. Um, Hugh tells me um, the largest um, in the world. And most recently, he's been the chief scientist for Queensland. So uh, an amazing um, career, Hugh. And uh, I'm going to turn over to you right now um, to um, tell us what you reckon. Uh, that 
they can hear Hugh. Can you hear me online? No. Um, They're looking, yes, no. It's much quieter than yours. Much quieter. Uh, I wonder why that would be. You know what we might do? I'll just go back. Okay. Fight with technology. <laughs> that never goes well, does it? Um, thanks a lot, Kelly. It's certainly um, great to be here and talk about an interesting topic. Um, I, I actually don't know anything about psychology, literally. I had, can't tell you how little I know. Fit on the top of a pin. I have to actually Wikipedia the word to make sure I actually know what, a, what psychology really means. Um, but I know it's important. Uh, and I know it's important because one of my roles at the moment, I, 20, I chair 23 boards and committees. And over the years, I've probably been on about 150 helping NGOs continuously, governments, all levels, local, state, federal, and international. Um, one of the most interesting experiences I had around psychology was I was on the Smart State Council, which Anna Bly uh, had when, when we had a smart state. Uh, well, I shouldn't say. We had a smart state council, and, and it was a dozen of us convened by a former chief scientist, Jeff Garrett. And every time we started discussing a very, very difficult issue around health or transport or conservation, uh, it always came back to one thing. Why, why can't we get people to behave the way we think they should, or we would might say sensibly or in their own best interests? And we never had an answer to that. <laughs> So it made me realise that behavioural psychology is just absolutely central to the future of the planet in every possible way. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of where we are, the Yagra and Tilbur people, and I'll come back to that a little bit when I talk about what is conservation and who does do things for nature and then who surprisingly doesn't do things for nature. And all I can really do is tell you my story and the fact I've been in the conservation movement since I was wrote my first very angry letters in the newspaper when I was 17 years old. Um, so in some senses, I'm the worst person to comment on it because I'm in it. And I've been in it for 43 years in, in every possible way. And uh, therefore, you know, I, I'm just so embedded in it, it's hard for me to see it. But I have met every kind of conservationist. I've sort of fought on every possible conservation issue that you can imagine. And all I, what I'm going to, the bulk of my talk is going to be um, very much uh, trying to work out why some people do things. So ha having worked in the conservation industry for so long, there are a lot of people who do things for conservation and then I want to know what motivates them and I've classified them into some classes. Now there's probably about 10 papers and 100 books on this. So that's good good fodder for, for Lily and Tassiano to say, hey Hugh, we know that. Um, all I can do is say from my own perspective because I don't know that literature. Um, the, then the question is why aren't more people involved in conservation? So going back to the First Nations people often when I do uh, acknowledge traditional owners, I reflect on the fact that they were obviously very much in tune with nature. So when I was, you know, even younger than 17, I was a bird watcher and I was a bird watcher in an all boys private school of a thousand people. I was the only bird watcher, one thousand, not really the most popular activity for a boy in an all boys private school. Um, and people thought it was very odd. And even until, even now, People come up to me and say, what are you doing? And I'm bird watching, saying, oh, that's a bit odd, bird watching. What's bird watching? And then I sort of reflect on the First Nations people. If we were here 300 years ago and we were interacting with the people who lived here, they were all bird watchers. There was no doubt about it. They were all watching nature. They were all talking about nature continuously. The flowering of the plants, what's the, the fish in the rivers, uh, uh, there was no conversation that wasn't uh, a lot about nature. Nature embedded their economy, their culture, their social life, everything. So what, what, what happened then that we went from a uh, species that uh, was lived and breathed nature to now there's a large number of people, and in Australia it's quite appallingly small, the number of people actually know anything about the natural world around them. That, that to me is remarkable. And in Australia, you know, it's quite, I lead a lot of volunteer bird walks for beginner bird watchers. And I'm sort of 
rather than thinking, um, I'm sort of amazed how little people know about something that happens every day over their head, two species of lorikeet will fly, a rainbow lorikeet and a scaly breasted lorikeet. They're easy to tell apart. And 98% of people in Brisbane have no idea what they are. So it's sort of, um, that, that I think is baffling. So most of my talk will be that I'm baffled. <laughs> um, my path to conservation uh, came through being a bird watcher, but then at the age of 17, my father and I went to our favorite bird watching spot and found it it had been flattened so and that sort of to just so you know how my mind works this is the place it was about 100 hectares of, of pink gum blue gum woodland near adelaide a habitat type that had already been 95 to 99 percent destroyed there's almost none of it left and that is typical of, of the agricultural districts of south australia and victoria lily will know this well some of these ecosystems have almost entirely disappeared. In that block of scrub, we would routinely see 50 species of bush bird, uh, 30 or 40 species of terrestrial orchid, over 100 species of plant. A very complicated interactive web, uh, mistletoe, mistletoe birds filling on mistletoe, butterflies feeding on the mistletoe leaves, all those things I knew well because I went there every month for years. And to see that complexity destroyed and turned into a wheat field in, a, in, in one, in, well, in probably over a week or two, was appalling to me, appalling to me. And so that's the transition from a person who's interested in natural history and working out like the way the world works to somebody who then basically, I, I shouldn't say this, but I, I like science, but I don't love science. I love nature. And for me, science, and I'm a mathematician as well, is just a means to an end. So it's fun, but to me, science is no more meaningful than playing a game of chess. You know, you play it, you try and win, uh, but then what's chess do for you? Not, not much. Science actually in math does get you somewhere for the purposes that I wanted to get to. So I ended up being a mathematician and scientist more by accident than anything else. I could have been a lawyer. Maybe that would have been a better, I put, probably should have been a psychologist might have been a better path to deliver outcomes for conservation but all, all, all my entire life is dedicated to outcomes for conservation I don't have any doubts about what I want to do when I wake up in the morning it's just one single purpose which is very simple um and I won't go on about the various activities I've involved in uh most of the time uh, I've worked very closely with the environmental NGO sector worked a lot with governments at all levels I suppose the period of time when I had most influence was, wasn't was actually when I was working for a big NGO, the Nature Conservancy Globally, as their chief scientist. Um, we worked in 80 countries, there were 500 scientists that I was uh, organising. Uh, it wasn't when I was the chief scientist of Queensland, to reporting directly to the environment minister, you would have thought that would be a, a place to get things done. Probably not, maybe a bit. Just finished our land clearing report, land clearing by far the most contentious and important environmental issue in Queensland and if not Australia, generally not talked about far, near, nearly as much as it should be, and a climate change issue. Um, uh, where I had most influence was when Robert Hill, who was the uh, our longest standing ever environment minister, who remembers Robert Hill? It's, anybody, it's a boring name, isn't it, Hill? <laughs> So he was a, the environment minister under John Howard. Uh, he was there for over five years as environment minister, and he was the head of the Senate, so a South Australian Liberal Party. So South Australian Liberal Party members are slightly different than Queensland Liberal Party members. And I won't go into that because that's politics. Um, is what they're what called wet liberals rather than dry liberals. Um, and he brought in the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So that's why we have that uh, 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 flagship environmental legislation. And I helped him do that. I chaired the National Biological Diversity Advisory Council. This is around about 1998 to 2001, 2002. Uh, and he really wanted to know, he was a very smart man, a lawyer by training, and he wanted to know the information and facts. And we got a lot of information and facts to him about how to invest in the National Reserve System the new legislation and building out what is now the world's biggest marine park system. So not only did we rezone the Great Barrier Reef, and that was done with my group software, we built a protected area system across all the states and federal government, which is basically the size of Western Europe. 
that particular area system. And he had that vision. It actually took him a long time. Even ministers for the environment have a vision of doing something in two years. He said to me, you know, we're going to get this reserve system done in the next two years. About 10 years later, it happened, which shows you that even if you're in government and you want to do something good for the environment, it, it, uh, it, it, it can be very slow. So um, ultimately, you know, getting stuff done boiled down to personal relationships, connections, bringing evidence to the table. And in fact, one thing he said to me, uh, which I think was most telling, was, Hugh, how come whenever I ask a scientist or a social scientist or an economist uh, a difficult problem, they almost always say, that's, I don't know, give me $10 million in five years and I'll tell you later. The, the biggest mistake you can make from a research academic perspective you continually ask for more research money. And, and, and you know, it's extremely tempting when you're approached by both, both business, public service and politicians or any of the NGOs to think, oh, they will fund my research. Never, ever think that. You must answer their question. Why? Because he said to me, you know, Hugh, I'm just, you, you tell me you're the world expert on this issue and you can't answer my question. What have you been doing for the last 20 years? What have you been doing if you can't answer my questions? So I have always taken the view, regardless of who I'm talking to, whether it's, whether it's a big mining company, uh, any political party at any level, environmental NGOs, I say, I think the answer is this. This is what I know. Then I usually say, but I'm not the expert on that issue. You should go and talk to Mary. Mary uh, and Cynthia, they are is their numbers, uh, go and talk to them. And I'm happy to comment on this further on. But I never leave them without some sort of answer. And I also express my uncertainty about that answer. Uh, and ultimately, uh, through all that service, strangely enough, you do end up getting resources to fund your research because they know you're doing things that actually can lead to answers. Um, so it is interesting you never know when something's going to happen. I'm happy to talk about that later. The Brigolo Declaration, which was probably the largest conservation win that we ever had in Queensland, stopped land clearing of several million hectares of habitat, which is basically we're talking about billions of tonnes of CO2. Land clearing in Queensland has often been 5 to 10% of our Australian, our entire greenhouse gas emissions for the country, let alone the huge impact on biodiversity. Remembering that we are clearing often at a rate of half a million hectares a year. Every hectare has 100 animals. So you can worry about the koala that's been hit on the road, or you can worry about the half a million hectares that's going, which is 50 million animals being killed every year in land clearing. 50 million vertebrates. Let's not worry about the insects. Who cares about the insects? 50 million vertebrates being killed every year in land transformation and five to 10% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So they're the big issues, I like to focus on them. Um, so who does care about conservation and who does get things done? I, I've thought about this for a long time and um, I, my classification is gonna be poor. And why do some people act? So I think based on the last election, there's a lot of people who care about the environment. My view of I'm, I'm really talking about nature conservation. I'm talking about biodiversity, that species, habitats, genetic diversity, and to some extent, ecosystem services from biodiversity. I'm not going to talk about the whole environment because that's huge. And it's arguably everybody cares about the entire environment. Everybody cares about the quality of the food they eat. They care about the quality of the water they get. But there's a, a remarkably small fraction of people who care about the mass extinction we're in the middle of. And to put that in perspective, and I say this many times, and it seems to have no impact whatsoever. And it's a controversial thing today. Say, a lot of people are highly agitated about climate change, as am I. And I will do everything. I'll just put an electric vehicle, um, fully electric vehicle. Uh, uh, that problem, I suspect, if it gets solved reasonably well, will play out and we will stabilise the climate in maybe 100 years' time. The biggest debate will be what temperature do we want? And maybe the Canadians won't think what we think. Who knows? Maybe they will. Um, it is a solvable problem. Uh, a lot of bad things will happen on the way to solving the problem. We're not saying 
lots of people will die, lots of people will go hungry, lots of people will go without water, and, and there will be an impact on biodiversity. We're heading towards wiping out 50% of the species. So that's a problem that will get solved in about 100 years, I hope, because I'm stupidly optimistic. Uh, and again, a lot of people will yell at me for saying that. Um, biodiversity, uh, if we wipe out half the species on the planet, the recovery time for that is a minimum of 1 million years. So it's 10,000 times longer. And you may not think it's such an important problem, but it's going to impact the future of humanity and the future of the planet 10,000 times as long, 10,000 times as long if we wipe out half the species on the planet. And so my prediction is in a thousand years time, they'll be cranky with us, me particularly, maybe some of you, we're living in the mass extinction and we're not stopping it. And, uh, that will be what they're most cranky about. They'll say, why did you wipe out half of the biodiversity in the earth? Why did you wipe out half the birds? Why did you wipe out half the mammals? Uh, we're sort of a bit upset. And then I think, who cares about these things? Well, I have a granddaughter who's 15 months old. What does is in every single one of my granddaughter's books? When she goes to nature play, what does she play with? Animals, insects, flowers. So some, for some reason, you can explain this to me. I have more questions than answers. We are born intrinsically in love with nature. The first things we want to see are animals and we learn their names. He knows about 35 words and half of them are flower bee animals. And in fact, strangely enough, later in life, we often go back, you know, I go to the bird watching club, give a talk. I'm sometimes the youngest person in the bird watching club. <laughs> I'm 60. So what happens in the middle there, again, is what, why it's not that we don't, almost genetically, intrinsically, culturally love nature and love the diversity of nature. We love intrinsically the diversity of nature. What, what causes it to disappear is what puzzles me most. So who does do things in nature? And I'll sort of end with this classification. And, and we, I don't know whether a classification is even important. The first group of people who clearly do stuff are people who have individual relationships with animals, often to do with pets and often to not, not necessarily native pets, but they often become animal wildlife carers. Uh, do they transition? Wildlife caring per se, to be very blunt, is not a, a, a conservation outcome in general. But they often do campaign on conservation issues because they come to realise that the reason why they're having to care for wallabies and koalas is because habitat's being destroyed. So that's number one. It's an individual relationship with an animal. Number two is that often transitions not just to wanting to have a relationship with an animal, which we all have love when we're young, but to, well, there's a koala, it's in a tree, I'm not going to have a relationship with it, but it's an iconic mammal, usually it's a mammal, because they're closely related to us, and I love them, I love mammals, I love whales, uh, uh, I love kangaroos, some people even love flying foxes, but there you go, I do too. Um, so that's number two, uh, then there's, there's sort of a divergence, this is on the animal line, those people who get into wild places, they don't necessarily have to identify anything. They just love big wild places. And the wilderness society in Australia is indicative that uh, we tend to not use the word wilderness anymore because it has the connotations of the absence of people. But we do know relative wild places, which can definitely have people in, but don't have a lot of uh, 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 Western uh, infrastructure in them, are appealing to many people. And they often become conservationists. Now, of all these sets, Sometimes not all of them are conservationists, but these are where the conservationists largely come from. And then there's the fourth one, which is my background, which is natural history background, which is quite a strong background. I just wanted to identify things. I want to sort nature out, which is why I become an ecologist. I want to know what its name is, and I want to know its relationship. I want to know how it lives. A lot of people go into animal behaviour, and many of those people, but not all. There's plenty of ecologists who love who, who, who love to understand nature, but will not do anything about conservation. There's many of those people. So there's that natural history bent. Um, I won't, I, I'm not gonna comment on an indigenous conservation ethic because it's clearly there, but I don't have any, I can't make a meaningful statement about it, but it, it's very strong. Um, and I think it's different from what I'm talking about. There's another group that I'd call users. So uh, uh, trekkers, and even hunters in the US, some of the duck hunters and uh, 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 wildlife users are huge conservationists. So the Nature Conservancy, uh, a part of its backbone was hunters. 
and they would preserve wetlands and they wanted wildlife to be abundant for a use purpose for a use purpose and the trekkers want the big natural areas more for a use purpose some of the wilderness society people didn't care that they would never go to the kimberley they just want the kimberley to be protected so i consider them slightly different ethics because one is involved with the use one is just knowing it's there and then we get to a couple so they're to me the core of the conservation movement the core of the conservation movement but they probably only represent about 10 percent of 15 percent of people and not all of those people uh, actually in the conservation movement. You can be, you can be love natural history and not at all want to lift a finger for conservation, which I find odd, but it's true. Then we get these other two groups that have emerged more recently, I suppose. Uh, well, many of my colleagues in America and Europe have championed the idea of ecosystem services, which is even more utilitarian. So I need big forests to clean the water and that's going to make economic sense. So people like Gretchen Daly at Stanford championed the notion of ecosystem services to actually convince more of the people get beyond the 15 to 20% to love nature because nature actually makes them money and gives them clean water and all those other things. So it's sort of again, even more utilitarian view and that's the why the word ecosystem services was created. And that is now transitioned. It's all the way to carbon. It's all the way to protection from storms and, and floods. Uh, uh, but in some senses, now we're not necessarily loving nature or loving animals. We're actually saying, I sort of love myself <laughs> and nature is quite useful. Um, so it's on a gradient, I suppose, what I've presented. And then finally, uh, more and more big companies and governments, just the weight of public opinion and the arguments from scientists said, we better sort this out because you know, clean air and clean water are important to human health. And they've got on this and companies are now saying, not only will they be climate neutral, uh, companies are saying that they will be biodiversity positive. So Oxford University, so university will be biodiversity positive and there are companies that will be biodiversity positive in the near future as they wanna be climate positive. So again, they're just hopping on and they see the weight of public opinion. They see what shareholders and Oxford, obviously their PR people says, you should meet these demands to be completely sustainable. So that's what I, so that's that's my classification. Um, so my question then is we are still missing a lot of people who haven't bought into any of those. The latter two are bought into the bit, but I'm sort of more, the last two are very utilitarian. It's very much, this is going to make me money. It's going to save my life. It's going to make me live, be healthier and live longer. Mental health benefits of nature. Again, a huge, recognised now, it's a huge advantage. But I, I'm still, I don't know why, why the core, the bottom five, the people who sort of love nature for a variety of reasons is, is relatively small. And it, in, intriguingly, it's, it's uh, the natural history side is much smaller in Australia than, than Europe and North America. And it varies a lot from culture to culture. Is it, my wife said, isn't it just GDP per person? Maybe it is. And I'm sure there's a paper on that. The fraction of people who just love uh, uh, natural history and all those things, is that just the GDP related thing because they have the time to do it? I have no idea. Um, how do you make that bigger? I know that COVID has made it bigger. So I know that when I go bird watching every month to Oxley Common, the number of bird watchers in the last 15 years has gone from half a bird watcher per visit to 15. So that's that's not just a young child bird watching, it's one person every second visit. So that's a 30 fold increase in the number of people out bird watching and taking bird photographs at a popular bird watching site. So the, the interest in natural history has grown a lot for a variety of reasons that, you know, from my simplest, my, going back all the way back to my first question, how do we go from indigenous cultures across the planet 20,000 years ago, where everybody cared about nature. How do we go from everybody caring about nature at the age of 15 months to where we are now with huge swathes of society having no idea and no interest in the natural world around them? I don't know. That's what that, but somebody's going to answer that question for me. Thanks so much, Hugh. That was um, that was great and uh, really wonderful to have uh, your reflections and your you know come out of experience, uh, long experience. Now I'm wondering whether um, maybe Christine could operate this while I just um, do the introduction for our next speaker, um, Professor Tassiano Tassiano Milfont. 
Uh, and so um, I have also known Tassiano for quite a number of years, and I'm always impressed by the breadth and the depth of his research. Um, and in particular, in particular, I really love the fact that he has a focus on culture, which is something I think as psychologists we don't pay nearly enough attention to. Uh, he's an internationally recognised environmental psychologist, and that's uh, evidenced by his uh, associate editor roles on the preeminent environmental psychology journals, Environment Behaviour and Journal of Environmental Psychology, by the fact that I'm not in entirely sure if he's still the director of the Environmental Psychology Lab at the University of Waikato, or whether he's perhaps had to hand that over, um, because he's moved into a new role. And I'm going to read this out so I get it right. So he's now, he's joined the New Zealand Ministry for the Environment in a role as lead of behavioural insights and behaviour change. And he tells me he's been th there for two months and it's been a, a big learning curve uh, in those two months. So um, I'm really happy that you're able to uh, join us today, Tassiano, and really keen to hear what you have to say about this um, topic. I'll hand over to you now. Kia ora, greetings from New Zealand. Thanks, Kelly, for the invitation and, and Winifred that couldn't be here and Lily for helping the event. Yes, um, I, I'm, I'm still an academic. <laughs> I'm, I'm still working for the university on Fridays and I'm speaking as an academic today. Um, one thing that I'm learning is that um, for, because I, I'm working most of my time for the, uni uh, for the ministry, uh, I don't have the same academic freedom within ministry so i need to um calibrate myself you know so it's something that i'm still figuring out how to to manage um yeah so i still an academic is still um directing the lab uh, but i'm talking today as an academic from um, the university of waikato and talking about the university, I want to start, sorry, but I need to mention this, that actually, supposedly, I shouldn't be working today because um, just because I'm part of the union, the university has suspended all union, union members today, um, which, you know, you, you can look at the news afterwards, but um, it's uh, unprecedented uh, and really upsetting. So, Go unions. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk briefly about the problem of, of course, you all are aware of it, you mentioned briefly, and then I will talk about the way I approach the problem. Um, I take this multi-level thinking. Uh, Kelly mentioned that I have an interest in, in cross-cultural cultural psychology. I'm not going to emphasize that a lot, but I will mention the, this multi-level thinking. And in particular, my interest in individual differences, because it's quite related to the question posed for, for this session. Um, and then I'll introduce psychological distance as a main barrier. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, describing what it means, but I'll give an example of spatial bias as a, uh, as a way to articulate psychological distance. And then um, I'll talk about the, being this stubborn optimistic and I thought to conclude talking about that, but I actually want to conclude by saying that it's really hard to be a stubborn optimistic. And I will explain why I believe that's really hard. Um, there is mention about indigenous people. So I want to start with a proverb from the Ma Maori people here in New Zealand. Te toto te tangata he kai, te oranga o te tangata he whenua. I think it illustrates uh, what Hugh mentioned of this intrinsic relation we have with the natural environment, because we can only survive because we, you know, because of the natural environment. So this interconnection with the natural environment was much more explicit uh, for indigenous communities and for our human hist history. Uh, and we can say that this disconnect with the natural environment is actually really recent, historically speaking. Um, and it's an anomaly, if you think about it. It's really odd because we still need the natural resource to, to survive. There is 
strong recognition um, that we live in a state of environmental crisis. So human induced climate change is already threatening plant and animal bi biodiversity, as well as human habitats. As Hugh mentioned, you know, there are many uh, animals that we are losing. And perhaps we tend to recognize that when we ourselves, so we, we, we bring this uh, anthropocentric view on the loss and how it can impact us and it might motivate us, um, which is distinct from uh, you know, this interconnected view of the natural environment in its own right to survive and other species to survive, not in this instrumental uh, relation, how it can benefit us. Um, but understanding this odd historical period that we are living, that you know, in the past we are much more connected uh, to the natural environment and why we are not as connected and why can we explain some people behaving in more pro-environmental ways than others. It's not easy task. I really like this tweet. Um, in science, when human behavior enters the equation, things go nonlinear. It's really hard to explain. You know, I try, I've been trying this, what, uh, what fascinates me, motivates me, um, but there is no single answer. Um, so I'll try to just portray the way I try to address the issue, you know, from my own discipline. As most of you know, uh, psychology focuses on the individual and in particular on individual behavior. Um, and I've been struggling to take a much more holistic perspective, um, you know, and reading outside psychology. And one way that I could more easily position my work within psychology was to address this um, understanding human behavior from a multi-level perspective. So that individuals, individuals' behavior are nested within household, which are nested within regions, within states, like in, in Australia, uh, and we are nested within nations. Yeah, so we can talk about individual qualities um, and barriers that might help us work and, and take pro-environmental uh, actions, but our behavior are constrained by particular layers, you know, and these layers are uh, starting with households, communities, regions, states, and broadly culture. So as Kelly mentioned, I, I, a lot of my work goes all the way up the, the layer and trying to understand um, cultural norms, and how particular cultural norms guide our behavior, and in particular in our relationship with the natural environment. But a lot of my work centers on individual perspective and individual differences. So today I'm going to focus more on individual differences. So recently I, I published a review of um, work, you know, trying to identify what are the, what are the, the characteristics psychological characteristics of individuals who are more willing to protect the, the natural environment. So these are not all um, that the literature has identified, but in my view, these are the more consistent. And of course, I'm not looking at um, demographic variables here. We could include demographic variables, but more broadly psychological constructs. So we know that there are particular personality traits. So individuals who are more open to new experience, who are more uh, agreeableness, and who has a more tendency to be, uh, to hold humility. Those are individuals who tend to be more pro-environmental than their counterparts. Similarly, we, we know uh, looking at basic human values, that individuals who hold dear values of self-transcendence, like equality, justice, uh, as well as openness to change, so um, open to new experience, um, you know, challenges or in aesthetics and, and learning new things. 
So individuals who hold DIA, those values tend to be more pro-environmental than those uh, who do not hold those values. Uh, he mentioned his granddaughter. Um, we also know from the literature that future thinking is quite important. Individuals who tend to position themselves in, in the future and think about the, the future implications of the present behavior tend to be more pro-environmental than those who are more focusing on hedonist, hedonistic values or orientations and the, the immediate um, benefits or outcomes. And finally, there is this broad ideology, uh, ideological orientations that broadly can say that the conservatives conservatistic view of the world. So political conservatism is one, um, but there is this other two twin ideologies of right-wing authoritarianism. So it's a promise to support um, authority, conformity, and tradition without question, questioning authority, tradition, and conformity. And social dominance orientation is a construct I, I'm particularly orient, uh, uh, interested. So it's uh, the view that um, people who have high levels of social dominance orientation tend to favor hierarchies in society and believe that some groups should be on top and others at the bottom. And I have translated this orientation into our current perspective of human dominance towards nature. But overall, individuals who uh, have higher levels of these ideologies, they tend to be less concerned about environmental problems, and they, ha uh, they are more likely to act uh, in anti-environmental ways. So beyond psychological differences, uh, I'm also quite interested in looking at particular biases that we might have. And theoretically, I'm, I, I really like the idea of psychological distance. And again, as I said, I'm not going to go into detail here, um, but the idea is that environment issues are perceived as psychologically distant. And these are manifested in feelings that these environmental problems are too uncertain. So I, I don't know if they're actually happening, you know, and this has been the argument for a number of years regarding climate change. So it's too uncertain. So I don't need to act on it. You occur far away. So it's happening there, not here. Far in the future, they are going to happen only in the future. I might not be alive, so I shouldn't care. And to people different from myself. So if I believe that things, environmental problems are too uncertain, they tend to be happening there to them in the future, my motivation to act now here is reduced. Yeah, so theoretically, I've been using this to understand um, as a, this as an overarching framework for barriers. And I will illustrate the impact on uh, thinking, thinking that environmental problems are worse there than here. Um, but before, I just want to illustrate that this, this is real. You know, in the book by David Attenborough, he, he talks about the shifting baseline syndrome. He argues that each generation defines the baseline or the norm regarding the natural environment by what it experiences. Um, he mentioned insects. I remember growing up, my parents driving the car and lots of insects would come to the car. Nowadays, you don't have that anymore. My daughters, probably you never experienced that. So for them, that's the norm. And he mentioned uh, birds. Like in New Zealand, we have many native species and you can talk to people who experience many birds around, many, many native species. Uh, and that was normative for them. But nowadays, you don't see those, um, those birds anymore. Yeah, so although they, 
Um, they've talked about the shifting baseline. Uh, I'll frame these in terms of psychological distance as well, because there's a temporal distance. You know, there is a temporal gap between our experience of what's happening and what we are going to observe later on. So the, the impact or the, or the environmental problems we experience now are the results of the behaviors of other people in the past. And our current behavior is going to have an impact on the future to come, yeah? So there is this distance, psychological distance or temporal distance, but I'm going to focus on the spatial dimension. Um, Dave Uzo is a famous environmental psychologist from the, the UK, and he was the first to name this phenomenon. Wasn't the first to identify or observe that, but he called, this phenomena, environmental hyperopia. So the idea that environmental problems are perceived as more worrying when they take place at greater distances. So the idea that people tend to believe environmental problems are worse there than here. So it's something I've been really interested. A few years back, we managed to collect data uh, in 26 countries. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail, but we identify this bias across most of the countries. The only outlier was Romania that you can see there, but across all the other uh, 29 samples, we found this bias. So people tend to believe environmental problems are worse uh, global, uh, internationally or worldwide than in their own country. More recently, I, I tried to replicate this finding in a single nation. As some of you already know, I'm from Brazil, so I managed to collect data from all states in Brazil, and we found the same phenomenon. So Brazilians tend to believe that environmental problems are worse there nationally than in their own state. And we argue that it, it is a bias because my state belongs to Brazil, yeah? So if everyone believes that the problems there, not here, it is a bias. And we link this bias with the better than average phenomenon, yeah? So that, or, or better than average. So if everyone believes that they are better than average, there is no average, yeah? So it is a bias. So this is how I've been, um, conceptualizing the issue. Um, I tend to take this multi-level perspective, but I, I, because of my training, I try to look at individual differences uh, and identify those psychological variables that can explain inaction and also action. But I wanna broaden up the discussion to more um, broader motivation and political context. So um, I would recommend, if you're interested in this area, this TED Talk and, and Christiana Figueres, uh, she was the chair of the Paris Agreement in 2015. She has a book about optimism. Um, and she argues that faced with today's facts, we can be indif ind indifferent, do nothing, and hope the problem goes away. We can despair and plunge into paralysis, or we can become stubborn optimists with a fierce conviction that no matter how difficult we must and we can rise to the challenge. And I thought to conclude my presentation with this optimistic view, um, but I think it's important to recognize that it's really hard to, to do so, yeah? It's really hard because the, you know if you work in this area, you're exposed to what's happening and it's really hard. So I will conclude with this idea of a stubborn optimistic perspective, but I wanna recognize that it's not easy. So for example, I really like this, this article that outlines this course of delay, delay action. You know, there is orchestrated ways to delay action and in particular on climate change. Um, and we are fighting and fighting to address this delay, but there are many forces 
you know, so we can understand psychological drives and barriers, but the context, again, the multi-level context is much broader. So this is one example. It's lots of um, discourse of delay. There is a lot of money involved, you know, and there is a lot of greenwashing. Uh, he mentioned briefly um, that the PR marketing within organizations talk about what consumers would like to hear. Uh, most of these actions are pure greenwashing. Yeah, so there is, these are new, uh, recent news. There's uh, the Z Energy news here. It's uh, the Lawyers for Climate Action in New Zealand. They, they went to court because there are now documentation showing that they are saying one thing, but in reality, they are doing completely something completely different. But this all involves money and a lot of money. Um, and the situation has become even worse, you know, because of the, the inequality gap. And sometimes this is really demotivating. If you're interested, you can watch this Netflix uh, documentary. Every single episode is like, wow, there's so much going on in terms of corruption and money. And so it's really, it's really frustrating and demotivating. And there are other news. Um, recently, the Swedish government, the brand new government, they said, well, we don't need an environment ministry anymore. Um, if you know what has been happening in Brazil, the situation there politically has been really, really serious. Yeah, so there is deforestation and it's happening in Brazil, but who is buying the, the, the logs? Yeah, the, the, we don't have enough market in Brazil to consume the amount of deforestation. There are other countries, other consumers like ourselves buying that. And what's happening even more is this um, propaganda machine. Yeah, so uh, this fire hose of household and it hasn't arrived strongly here in New Zealand and I don't think has arrived strongly in Australia but it's happening, has happened in the US, has happened in, in, in UK with Brexit, and has happened again in Brazil with the re recent election. So we are trying to fight this huge machine. Um, it's not easy, you know, there is so many, so much going on. Um, and we might address, try to address this machine with uh, strategies like debunking false information, but again, the, the sheer amount of uh, fake news, the amount of money funding these is just another level. So still, I wanna conclude with this, that um, the stubborn optimism is important because hopes is the better choice, but it's important to recognize that it's really a big thing. And this explains why I decided to take the role within the ministry to try to make an impact, you know, beyond university context. Okay, so that's me. Thank you very much. Tassiano, and thanks to both the speakers who've been remarkably on time. Um, <laughs> so I wanna hand over to Lily now who um, is going to pose some questions, one or two questions to both you and to Tassiano uh, to probe, to provoke. I don't know, Lily, I'll, I'll let you kind of take whatever tack you see as uh, most uh, appropriate. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Hugh and Tassiano for fascinating talks that obviously draw on such a wealth of experience. Um, I've got lots of thoughts flying around in my head, so I might just start asking a few questions and, and ask you to reflect <coughs> on what each other has said and, and we'll take it from there. But I guess um, the, the last thing that, that you just said, Tassiano, um, about moving into government to make impact, I also work in government and Hugh's obviously got um, experience in, in a few different realms of, of, of influence. Um, and I guess something that Hugh said um, Maybe going back a step, a lot, a lot of what's been discussed today 
as you noted, Tassiano has been um, talking about individual factors that shape whether people behave be, um, behave in a certain way, and and Hugh kind of developed a bit of a, a loose typology of, of of values around why people may or may not value the environment. Um, but I think in so for me as a, someone who works in behavior change, a lot of what I do also also targets individuals. I try to take a multi level systems thinking approach. But if we want to have this bigger impact. Um, how do we get the big systems change to happen that changes the institutions and the societal structures that encourage people to act in ways that are pro nature? Um, something Hugh said made me think about that in that a lot of what we've talked about was individuals and, and Hugh, um, I guess, reminded us that people working in government are individuals and may or may not held, hold these values that we conservationists who've drank the Kool-Aid and we're already converted. Um, but sometimes, you you know, whether or not the people in government that, that you want to implement a particular policy or take action on something, a lot of it comes down to their values and their interests and the, and the psychological factors driving them and, and things like that. And so I, I wondered whether either of you wanted to um, maybe reflect on your experiences in that space or, or talk about how um, you can have influence in that way in, in understanding the values that shape people working in government and, and, and the structures in government that influence where the change can happen to have a bigger system, systemic change, I guess. Cassiano, that's a very complicated question. I'll let you go first. Thanks, you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I've been in government as such uh, for a short period. Um, so I'm still figuring it out. Uh, we, we are part of a quite unique unit. So although my role is in behavior insights, as you know, Lily, behavior insights is really specific. Often it's quite specific, but our unit is a enabling function. Um, so we have the opportunity to really influence policy thinking from a holistic perspective from the design to the delivery. And, and our unit sits within a new uh, division within the ministry uh, that's tasked with, tasked with the implementation of the policies. There is a huge recognition from the ministry here in New Zealand that um, they are just creating policies and they say, well, our work's done, but they didn't implement the policies. They didn't evaluate the policies. So we sit within that division looking at the design and the implementation of the policy. And currently there are, there are lots going on. Like there is a, hu a, a, a huge change on the, the overall resource management policy across all the environment, built environment and natural environment in New Zealand. There is a huge uh, program of, of policies coming for, for freshwater and also biodiversity. So I think, as you mentioned, the, the progress can be really slow, um, but is bringing this holistic perspective from the, the thinking of the policy. Uh, and we also have the opportunity to help select people that come to work in the ministry. So our division is quite unique because we sit in a division, but we can float around. Um, so, for example, um, I'm working with the sustainability team within the ministry to see what about our own impact as an organization and our own individual behavior within the organization. So these are the areas I'm trying to make an impact, you know, so it's the organization in itself. Who can we recruit that perhaps has already this holistic view and a future thinking? Um, the organization as an entity and the impact it has in society and how it operates with other ministries and other organizations and with community and the design and implementation of the, these broad policies. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I agree with um, the comments by Tessiano and, um, and Lily as well. Maybe I'll, I'll go on a bit of a tack. So, did learn in my two years of government and working with public servants at all levels for a long time. There's an enormous amount of dedication, a lot, a lot of talent and hard work. There's also a lot of people who are frustrated and very tired. 
with maybe that describes the university sector as well. So, and and there is a tendency to say this is very hard and it's slow. That once somebody smart person once said to me, you know, uh, you governments aren't stupid because I have a bit of a habit of yelling at them. Um, governments aren't stupid, you. They're just slow. They actually know what to do. It just doesn't happen at the pace you expect it to happen. Um, it's interesting the narrative from and the modus operandi from the Nature Conservancy and a lot of the US is completely different. And I think Australia and New Zealand are very similar in this sense. We think governments are going to solve most of the big problems. In much of the United States and the Nature Conservancy, they would say no, sort of give up on governments. And if you plot environment spending federally or in the states, uh, there will be moments of increases, but on average, I think, uh, and Lily may have some data on this, it's going down one or two percent per year, every year, for 30 years. The prosperity of our two countries has poured into keeping you all alive and healthy, for better or for worse. That's where all the money goes, basically. That's a massive gross simplification. So these people in the public service, they have one or two percent less every year to save an environmental problem that gets bigger every year. Uh, and so the Nature Conservancy and a lot of other people now say, let's just stop yelling at the government, trying to get them to do things, go to private industry, go to other sectors and let them, because they're faster and they have the bulk of the fungible resources. They're the people that can probably do things. So I think that's what's happening. And in some senses, I think an interesting question then is, yes, from the conservation, psychology of conservation, I notice in Australia, every time, I, whether I'm meeting the friends of Oxley Creek Common arguing about some weeding, the reaction of almost everybody in Australia is, let's go and talk to the council and government, get them to do something. I'm sort of more or less saying, no. <laughs> in fact, we've been trying to, 15 years trying to get Oxley Creek Common transferred from the local government to the state government. And we can't get them to do that in 15 years, even though they both want to do it. It's remarkable. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. So we just started to do things, putting in benches, planting trees, and ignoring getting permission from everything we do. And so I think that's that's a tiny example. And now I think the big companies are just saying, we can't wait for the government anymore. We'll have voluntary carbon markets. We'll have voluntary biodiversity markets. We're going to solve the problem because the government's all too slow. Uh, and that's not the way Australians typically think. And I think we have to rethink. Actually, I'll, I'll keep this, shouldn't I? Or you'll. Or, or. I will just sort of hand back over to Lily because she might have a follow up or another question because we still have a little bit of time. Lily, did you want to pose another question, uh, big picture question to Tassiano and to um, Hugh? Yeah, may, I mean, if this is the last kind of big picture question I ask, it might be a bit of a long rambling one that encompasses a couple of things. But I guess just maybe. Um, tapping into a couple of things that both said so so Tassiano talked about you know sometimes it is difficult to be an, op, an optimist and I think maybe I'm I don't want to feed into that and make it worse but um you know I think about both of you talked about psychological distance um and I mean some of the liter literature that's out there and some work that I've been doing as well talks about how for people to become conservation advocates I'm sure so many of us in the physical and virtual room here can attest that, that for us, it's been about our local contact with nature. Um, and why, as Tassiano mentioned, has that become a recent phenomenon that for so many people, there isn't that connection? And I mean, to what extent is that a really big system problem of just globalisation? that the consumption of things and the impact of our consumption is further away. We don't need to understand our local environment to be able to survive anymore. Um, so I guess maybe if you want to con con consider how we tackle globalization, but maybe more, my question is more, how do we get people to reduce that psychological distance as it appears that may be happening with climate change to some extent, people are starting to see more how it may affect them personally, affect their hip pocket, affect their grandchildren, those sorts of things. How can we reduce that psychological distance and, and get a broader suite of people concerned about biodiversity? I'm going to throw to Tassiano again, because I think that's his area of specialty. Um, yeah, um, we, we, became, we became the market, you know, so the, the focus is on 
and you know, it came to my mind what Meta is doing and trying to make, you know, you might not need to experience the natural environment anymore because, um, you know, we're going to these virtual realities, but the focus is to make money. So I would counter the idea of the, the, the slow of governments because, and yeah, and I want to recognize that I was really impressed by how much um, people are doing, you know, in this. I, I, I didn't have any idea how much, how, how hard they work. Just impressive. And you know, they're daily trying to achieve um, good things. You know, public servants are amazing. Um, but I'll counter the idea of um, trying to speed up things because in a way we experience the result of this idea that we need speed and production and growth. Um, and perhaps to reconnect ourselves to the natural environment is uh, rethink about speed and time and slow down. You know, not to achieve things necessarily, but to enjoy life. You know, and 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 th that's something that's happening to me professionally. Uh, some some mention that oh, when you become a professor, you try to figure out other things to do. Um, and after becoming a, a parent as well, like the the recognition that well, slow is better most of the time. Yeah. So it's a combination of this pressure of capitalism, globalization, that we need to grow, grow faster, faster. Um, but that's part of the problem. So that's my take, Lily, sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a, an, a different tack to Lily's question, which I think um, is partly about how do we get more people to engage? Because I mean, Tassiano has given a diagnosis of the problem and, and given the data and statistics, it's very compelling. I mean, and I have to say briefly, one thing I, I often say at the beginning of my talks is I come from a position of ridiculous privilege and my relationship with nature is because I've never had to worry about food, water, shelter, and I can go out and camping is a novelty and being bitten by flies and chasing, being scared by snakes is, is something that I enjoy, whereas for many people it's not. <laughs> and I've never had to worry about anything. Uh, a white male Australian massively overeducated. So I, I have a lots of time and have the resources to enjoy nature, which I think is challenging for other people. I'm going to just tell two two stories. Hopefully I can remember them both. Um, uh, relevant to changing people's mind, yes. So the Nature Conservancy also used to have a, we had a big program of getting kids out to nature with the view to sort of uh, what Lily was talking about, if only we could get more experiences in a big city it's hard in Brisbane it's it's in, there's no excuse not for enjoying nature you can all everybody can walk 50 meters I mean there's there's we had a postdocs in a room they found over 1,000 species of organism in their back garden in wool and gabba you know 400 square meter block this isn't a big leafy garden 400 square meter block 1,000 species so we are very lucky lucky if we're riveting in the middle of of Singapore or Beijing, that might not be so easy. The Nature Conservancy had a lot of programs of getting uh, disadvantaged kids out into nature, and and they ended up actually not being sure it worked because for every story about people being inspired by the experience of nature, there's also a lot of people who go out and get bitten by insects and get hot and sweaty and tired and sleep on hard ground and see a snake, and they hate it. And in fact, I'd be interested, well, maybe it's a big open question is is although you can sit around a whole heap of conservationists and they'll tell you a story about how they became a conservationist it usually involves an interaction with the wild place or, or or beauty or animals but the evidence that more interactions will make more conservationists is is a bit patchy and i think there's an interesting research question and the other thing i'll quickly say is giving a lot of voluntary bird walks to the community groups which i do probably every month you know I, I will obviously be focused on helping people identify birds which is what i got into nature for but it will drift into conservation stories and what's going on what compels people i can sit there and say we're in a biodiversity crisis and half the species on the planet even disappear it makes no that, that cuts no ice that's i'd say it because it's a scientific fact it does nothing 
because it's, I think it's the Tassiano, it's far, 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 different places, somewhere else in another country, it's a long way away, I can't do anything about it. When I tell them that the number of willy wagtails in Sherwood Arboretum has gone from two pairs when I first arrived 20 years ago to one pair, and now there's one lonely singing male, uh, they're very upset and they want to know what to do about it. So I think, you know, you're right. You know, you have to connect people to a story that actually affects them, and it has to be often at, at an individual animal level, which is why I think climate change has been such a fight, even though it is an existential crisis for the planet, for humanity. It's been such a fight because of all the, and it's amazing. I mean, I, I go into the, I'm definitely a stubborn optimist. Some people say I, have, I suffer from toxic positivity. I don't know how positivity became toxic, but I'm accused of it routinely. Um, you know, I'm amazed in a way, given the greed and the nastiness of general humanity, that we've sort of agreed to do something about this thing. I was sort of always surprised because uh, it is it meets all Tassiano's criteria of a, a, a very intractable problem, but we seem to be doing something. Thank you, Hugh. Now, um, and thanks, Lily, for those, I think, really great big picture and thought-provoking questions. Um, I would like to now open up to the audience. Um, um, just because I think we've actually got less people um, here uh, in the audience and online, I might just give the audience a couple of questions, but I would really love that I can see one, I don't know whether it's a comment or a question in chat. I would really like to, um, if you just sort of think about your questions and either put them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question but let me just spend a few minutes asking those here in the audience if anyone would like to pose a question to um, uh, either Hugh or Tatiana or both and I'm sorry I don't know your name but um, I'll just I'm going to run around with this so that the people online can actually hear the question. Yeah, I assumed you'd want this online. Um, so I've got one question for Hugh and one question for Tassiano, and I apologize if I mispronounce the name. Um, so for Hugh, you were talking about um, how we went from a society that knew everything about nature or knew a lot about nature to one where you can't tell the difference between two birds flying above you. One, I was wondering, could that be due to just limited learning resources? So in uh, prior to being a technological society, you had a lot, you could learn a lot and there wasn't much to learn that was technological. Whereas nowadays you have to learn how does the computer work? Uh, what's the best way to sit on a chair? How, where should I expect the light switch to be and how do light switches work? Um, and all of that stuff. So not even just the advanced technology, but just how to interact with a room in a sense or why to use a room, when to use it. And for Tassiano, you were talking about, uh, I think you said something about psychology being on an individual level. Um, I was curious whether you've ever come across the ideas of um, in physics of phase transitions or statistical mechanics, where you can talk about microscopic models, say an atomic level, and see bulk behavioral differences due to minor changes um, in say the state of matter, whether it's an ice or water. That you're looking at um to to okay all right <laughs> there's a pattern to this um take it away tassiano young and fast and smart yeah i um i, I know that our mother is trying to link psychology and physics i i'm not really aware um but in the from a multi-level perspective you look at the interactions between layers as well um, and I, I, I emphasize that it, because as a, as a discipline, you know, historically as a discipline, psychology tends to focus on the individual. Um, but social psychology, as we know, study the unit of interaction, you know, and environmental psychology talks about transaction between individuals within context. So, Yes, so these these interactions, these units, how a system modifies itself because of uh, another variable is we study that. Um, but often we don't take this multi-level constraint nested perspective. So when I talk about multi-level, I often emphasize, you know, the limitations of psychology as a discipline historically, uh, just to make the point. 
but I think we always study interactions, you know, in some level and how things change on the system. And going back to your first question, I think your theory is a good theory. I mean, I remember seeing my mother's high school botany book where they'd sketch flowers. Who sketched flowers when they were at high school? I don't know, maybe some people did. But it seemed to me that, that you know, that then when my school experience, there was no interest in teaching me anything about nature. It was it was do the maths and and you know, go and become an engineer or whatever. So the, biology, in fact, was was in my uh, baby boomer, end of baby boomer phase was the subject you did if you couldn't do science very well, but you sort of were vaguely interested and you couldn't count. So it was it was the dummy science and that did a lot of damage, I think, uh, you know, and I think that those things are reversed and I definitely see in schools now children particularly integrating maths biology and physics and chemistry into one more holistic perspectives and there's there's no prejudices about it so I'll, I'll be interested to see I, I feel as though people coming out of high school and university more interested in nature than they were from uh, 40 years ago all right well actually I was thinking it might be fairer to sort of go tic-tac between the in the room and online and so um, Patricia Sheehan's got a, um, a question here saying that um, uh, she's leading up, uh, leading up to the referendum on gay marriage in Australia. Nearly every Wednesday at UK had a show to yes poster, but almost no climate action now posters. Um, same population of smart people. So how did the yes campaigners get people to reduce psychological distance? How do we copy them? So I think the kind of question is whether or not we can learn lessons from other types of, uh, uh, you know, issues where they've, you know, managed to, uh, you know, mobilise people to uh, the, to um, take action. Um, did you want to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, because I think this is quite a psychological question, I'm going to um, throw over to <laughs> Tassiano <laughs> for a comment. Yeah, I, I think the work you, Kelly and Unifred, do on activism can answer that. Um, but they, I just want to mention, Patricia, that I would say I would use guest out to understand this as a figure ground, you know, that daily we are, we are exposed to so many things. And perhaps in that particular period, gay marriage was um, the figure in the context. So it was psychologically salient and people would be acting on it and they would put aside climate change. Um, but of course, climate change is much bigger and consequential, but um, yeah, so we constantly daily, we are interacting this figure ground guest out way, you know, what's more salient for us psychologically to act. Hmm. Um, I think Christoph in the room has a question. So I'm gonna race over, hand the microphone over. Hi, thanks for the talk. So I just have a question to Hugh, and I want to ask about the relationship between climate change and biodiversity. Because you said that climate change is a bit more immediate compared to biodiversity, which I do agree. But I was just wondering, to what extent can we think of them as independently? Or do is it even possible to um, protect biodiversity in a significant way without actually limiting climate change? Yeah. A, a very good question and a, a, not an easy question to answer quickly, but I'm gonna try. Um, one fact is we know uh, that, and the Nature Conservancy did a lot of work on this and wrote some high profile papers in PNAS, uh, uh, protection of nature is about 30% of the climate change problem to 2050. So protection of forests, mangroves, ecosystem species, that will actually solve 30% of the problem, which is remarkable. By, by 2050, the ability for nature to sort of solve our problem disappears. By then, one would hope that we're very close to being completely decarbonised. So yes, uh, in that direction, biodiversity is a is big part of the climate change solution. Uh, uh, how much climate change people often say it is the biggest threat to biodiversity. I, I have to disagree at the moment. I would just say uh, uh, it might be in the future. If you go through the stats and the numbers, the number of extinctions from climate change is still quite small. They will go up. Uh, but just habitat destruction, it's not that complicated. It's not that even intellectually interesting. Destroy habitat, 
species go extinct. And in islands like Australia, invasive species is the second biggest. Now that, so yes, I agree, we do need to, if we let climate change run out of control, it's going to have a big impact on biodiversity. You'd be surprised how resilient biodiversity is to some things. For example, people say, what about warming temperatures, species moving their distributions? Well, they already do it. There's flying foxes in Melbourne. Uh, and uh, a big climate change experiment is most cities, which is two or three degrees Celsius warmer than, than the surrounding area. We've warmed the cities. Did the trees all die? Did all the birds fall out of the trees? Did... No, but maybe some of the insects are disappearing because of warming in cities. Um, uh, so I think, you know, you have to work on them together. I think you justify them and work on them. You wouldn't want to just solve one problem without solving the other problem. I suppose I'm just a little bit pissed <laughs> because my passion, which is the diversity of nature, which was going really well as the headline environmental thing, has been trumped by something which I still think is important, <laughs> but now overwhelms the environment debate. 90% of the environment debate is climate change, 10% of the biodiversity, and you heard me justify why I think those those efforts should be reversed. But it's it's all because of urgencies and other things. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and so I haven't seen any questions um, before I go. There is another question in the room. I just want to double check that there isn't uh, another burning question that someone wants to unmute themselves and ask online. And if there isn't, then I'm going to um, I'm going to hand over to Matthew. Oh, good. Yeah, because it's a question for Hugh. Um, I'm just asking a question about um, motives and how much motives matter. Because, um, you know, I, I find a lot of my activist friends, they want people to do the right thing, but they also want people to do the right thing for the right reasons. Um, and you mentioned categories of conservationists where they're doing it for selfish reasons or because they're hunters or whatever. How much does motive matter to you? I'm very means to an end, uh, and so I don't care why people have the motive. So I'll I'll literally do anything, anytime, anywhere to convince a person. And if I could work out, if I was any good at had any empathy and any good psychology ability, I could probably I would do what needs to be done on the day to convince a person to devote more to nature. My personal passion is 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 to be. I think it's well. It's it, it's. I think it's. It looks entirely altruistic. I just love the diversity of life and, and I hate it disappearing. The fact it won't actually disappear much in my life, even if we do make a mess, then makes me upset because of all the other people who will live who love the diversity of life. But I, my love of, the, of diversity is inexplicable. It, it, and, and it's very different. Some people are bird watchers because they love watching a willy wagtail for half an hour. I just love seeing 70 species of bird in my three hour walk. And I don't have no idea why I like that. And it's, yeah, so it's, 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 in, it's, it's inexplicable as love, but I don't expect everybody else to have that strange, bizarre stamp collecting diversity taxonomy thing. <laughs> Thanks, Hugh. Um, other questions uh, for those of you online? Oh, my goodness, uh, it's gone from... Um, <laughs> okay, so Shu, um, at the individual level, psychological distance may be due to low efficacy feelings. Nice question, Shu. Um, uh, individuals cannot see a direct outcome from their actions, especially in developing countries. For example, people suffer from extreme climate events, but individually they may not be able to do much and the climate resilience depends on global actions. How can we increase the feeling of control? Um, I think uh, that's, I think that's an interesting question, um, and we have somebody who's got an expertise in this, right, sitting uh, in front of us. But um, maybe we could throw over to Tassiano first because this is a bit of a vexed question, I think, amongst us as psychologists, don't you think, Tassiano? How do we increase that sense of efficacy and control so that people will feel like um, taking action will actually make a difference? Yeah, and goes back to Lily's question that I didn't fully answer, but you got it, you know, like how do you reduce psychological distance? Um, and again, I think you guys have a, an amazing work there. I would, I would answer that in terms of um, collective action and social, social identity, you know, so um, you can counter this drop in the ocean feeling that the problem is too big for, for me. If you find others that um, share the same motivation or as you 
said they might not have the same motivation, but they want the same outcome. Um, and if you, you know, create this sense of collective efficacy, uh, it might be more motivating uh, to act. So yeah, my simple uh, answer, I just want to acknowledge Matthew. Thanks, Matthew, for, for being here. Um, yeah, missing you. <laughs> Yeah, I learned something today, which is relevant to this. It's not really particularly relevant to uh, people in developing countries, but I think it's relevant to Australians. When I talk about climate change, people often say, oh, well, what can we do? It's a really annoying argument. You know, it's all about China and the United States. And I say, well, you know, we are the biggest, one of the biggest per capita polluters, so we should do something. Uh, uh, tonight at 5 p.m., you can register online. It's a WWF book launch by Ross Garno about uh, the energy superpower. And in there, I just heard him do an ANU podcast, and we're launching the book tonight. If you can go and get a ticket, it's free. And I think there's free food, so it's going to be appealing. Um, um, at QUT at 5 p.m., I just, while I was practicing to be the MC and introduce him, he puts his argument that, in fact, um, because we have so much renewable power, we are actually 8% of the global climate change solution because we're going to have to refine all the ores for the planet here because you can't send the energy there. You can't send it in things underground. You lose the transmission cost, whether it's hydrogen. Fossil fuels was very cheap to move from place to place. Uh, renewable energy, there's no cheap way to move it. And so the whole nickel, aluminium, iron ore is, is going to have to be processed where the energy is being created and we're going to be the energy superpower. So, and if we do that right, that's 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So we are a huge part of the solution. So lobbying the Australian government to build that steel and iron ore uh, uh, steel and nickel and aluminium manufacturing industry is, is critical. And I think in, in making that answer, I think what you've highlighted is that notion of being solution focused, which I think could help to give people a sense of efficacy. Now, I'm a little bit mindful of where we are time wise. Uh, and um, there was another question that was following up um, around um, uh, uh, the distance bias. I mean, Tassiana, can you see that question? And would you like to kind of give a super quick um, uh self okay right <laughs> oh you yeah. have okay we frame it as a self-serving bias okay it's beneficial oh yeah we, we don't okay. frame as a, a as a defensive mechanism as such but as a self-serving bias similar to the better than average thing uh, you know it's 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 a self-serving bias to say oh i'm be I better than the average and the same is better to think the problem's worse there than here. So it's similar, Angela. 